Hi everyone, I'm Mark DeYoung. In this video, we will continue to explore the history of the piano in jazz. In part one, we briefly explored two early pianists who were both innovative and influential, Jelly Roll Morton and James P. Johnson. In this video, we continue by checking out Earl Father Hines and Teddy Wilson. Earl Hines was born in 1903 in Duquesne, Pennsylvania. His early exposure to music included brass bands, where his father played cornet, inspiring young Earl to pick up the same instrument. Hines also played classical piano and was the organist in the local Baptist church. He had an exceptional ear and musical memory, which served him well as he developed his performance skills. In 1923, while still a teenager, Hines joined Pittsburgh saxophonist vocalist Lois Depp with the band Depp's Serenaders, with whom he toured and made his first recordings in New York City. What would later become Hines' signature style of using octaves in the right hand was developed at least in part during his time with Depp, as he needed to figure out how to make himself heard while playing with such a boisterous 10-piece band. Also noteworthy is the fact that Hines and Depp are considered to be the first African-American musicians to broadcast on radio in 1921. He also made his recording debut with Depp in 1923, with a solo featured on the tune Con Jane. Soon after, while gigging in Chicago, Hines began working with New Orleans trumpet great Louis Armstrong in the Carol Dickerson Orchestra, and Hines would make his first recording along with Armstrong in Johnny Dodd's Black Bottom Stompers. Chicago was proving to be fruitful for Hines, as he landed a seven-night-a-week gig playing with clarinetist Jimmy Noon's Apex Club Orchestra. But more importantly, Hines would eventually join Armstrong's Savoy Ballroom 5, leading to the famous landmark Hot 5 and Hot 7 recordings in 1928, which would change the future of jazz. On those recordings, as well as solo piano recordings on OK and QRS from the same year, you can hear Hines' right hand, called trumpet-style playing. Also check out his distinctive left hand, umpa technique, which differed from earlier stride piano as it broke up the regular bounce rhythms with more syncopation and accents. Plus, his dazzling solos would set a new high mark in modern jazz piano playing. Check out Potato Head Blues, Basin Street Blues, and a piano trumpet duet with Armstrong called Weatherbird. Hines was also an important band leader, leading his own big band during the heyday of the swing era and beyond for almost two decades. His big band was important training for such young future icons as Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, and vocalist Sarah Vaughan. He disbanded the group upon rejoining Armstrong as a regular member of his All-Stars, but after three years, focused again on his solo career, working frequently as a soloist and a feature performer. For the next 30 years, Hines would continue to dazzle audiences around the world with his energetic and finely crafted musicianship, showmanship, and pianistic nuance. He died in 1983. I've invited Calgary pianist Mark Lamacher to showcase elements of Hines' distinctive piano style. Next, we are going to examine the inimitable pianist Teddy Wilson. Wilson was born in Austin, Texas in 1912. As a young child, Wilson's family relocated to Alabama, where his parents maintained notable roles as educators at the famous Tuskegee Institute. His musical journey began at age seven, starting with piano but also including violin, oboe, and clarinet. He was still a teenager when he encountered the influential jazz recording by Bix Beiderbecke, Singin' the Blues, 
and soon after he heard McKinney's cotton pickers live in concert, cementing his decision to follow a life in music. He studied music at Talladega College for a year, but soon headed to Detroit, where he joined the Speed Web Territory Band. In 1930, he settled for a time in Toledo, Ohio, where he subbed regularly for jazz piano legend Art Tatum, with whom he frequented many late-night clubs and after-hours parties. Wilson moved again, this time to Chicago, where he joined the likes of Erskine Tate, Jimmy Noon, and recorded with the Louis Armstrong Orchestra. He would also sub for fellow pianist Earl Hines at Chicago's Grand Terrace Ballroom, where a radio broadcast caught the ear of jazz impresario John Hammond. Hammond would then introduce Wilson to New York bandleader Benny Carter, and the next day, Wilson moved to the Big Apple. Hammond was a firm believer in the musical gifts that Wilson possessed, and was a tireless advocate for Wilson that enriched his career in many ways, such as negotiating his first recording contract with the Brunswick record label, in addition to putting him in contact with Billie Holiday and the King of Swing clarinetist Benny Goodman. The Goodman contact would prove extremely valuable for Wilson's career, as he was soon a regular member of the newly minted Benny Goodman Trio, along with star drummer Gene Krupa. The trio also featured vibraphonist Lionel Hampton and sometimes guitarist Charlie Christian, and was included in the famous 1938 concert at Carnegie Hall. Check out recordings that feature Wilson's incredible accompaniment and soloing along with Holiday's masterful interpretation of songs on tunes like These Foolish Things and Mean to Me. Wilson would later enjoy long-term residencies at clubs like Cafe Society and was also on the faculty for a time at the Juilliard School. With recording credits on Columbia, Verve, and even a film appearance as himself in 1955's film The Benny Goodman Story, Wilson would undoubtedly be remembered as an elegant yet vital contributor to the lexicon of jazz piano. Joining us once again is Calgary pianist Mark Lamacher to demonstrate aspects of the Teddy Wilson style of playing. <laughs> 